I was just look, waiting for this one up here. We're ready. Okay, we'll call the meeting to order. May we have roll call, please? Ms. Moore? Here. Mr. Pollock? Here. Mr. Wright? Here. Mr. Lopez? Here. Mr. Young? Here. Mr. Sheridan? Here. Thank you. Um, if everyone would check your cell phones and make sure they're off, please. The first item on the agenda is approval of the minutes from the March 29th, 2016 meeting. Do we have a motion to approve? Madam Chair, may I make a motion to accept the minutes as they are? Mr. Lopez, thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Is there any discussion? No. Nope. Seeing none, we'll call the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Next item is for public comment, and this is the time when anyone from the public can speak to the board for any item except the public hearing item. We'll get, deal with that one later. Um, we have two public meeting items tonight, and if anyone's here on those, this would be the time to speak to the board as well. Seeing none, we'll close public comment. Next item on the agenda is the deviation for 1017 Pearson Drive. Do we have the applicant? Would you come up to the podium, please? State your name and address for the record. My name is Adam Coyman, and I live at 784 South Lake Clare Circle in Oviedo, and I'm representing the Trevino family as the pool contractor. They're out of state. Okay. You want to tell us about your project and why we should approve it? Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. Um, basically, there's a swimming pool that they'd like to install in the backyard of the home. Um, there's a fairly large easement in the backyard, so it's taking up a good portion of the, of the backyard. So we would like to put the pool equipment on the side of the house. Um, on the right side of the house, as you're looking at it from the street, is um, plenty of room to put some pool equipment there. Um, but there was an issue with not allowing anything in that setback. So we went ahead and, and did a review um, and submitted all the information required to the planner. And we also found out during that time that there's an air conditioning unit that's been out of compliance since 1987 over there. And uh, that air conditioner happens to be on the same side of the house that we're trying to put the pool equipment on. And the reason why we want to put the pool equipment on that right-hand side of the house towards the back of the house is because the only other option would be to put it actually on the back of the house, and that would restrict even more usage of the pool deck back there. Um, so because we have to stay out of the rear easement, um, it would just be a huge benefit to the homeowner to not have the pool equipment sitting on the back of the home right next to where they're going to have their patio furniture and grill and things of that nature. Um, basically, the pool equipment will take up the same amount of space as an air conditioning unit. Um, we went ahead and got a letter from the neighbor saying that she doesn't mind if we put it over there. There's a wooden privacy fence that you can't see through between the two neighbors and the AC unit's been there once again as I stated since 1987 and it hasn't caused any problems since then um, so we felt like the addition of a similar sized pool equipment unit over there um, would once again not cause any problems for this foreseeable future. The homeowners also are more than willing to do any type of mitigation that you all deem necessary um, they've already committed to maintaining the existing privacy fence and making sure it stays in good condition. And they're also willing to plant a shade tree if you think that's a good idea to offer some sort of mitigation um, if you allow us to do this. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions of the applicant? Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Appreciate the opportunity. May we hear from staff? Thank you, Madam Chair. This is a request for the local planning agency to approve the following deviations listed below. A 2.5 foot 50% deviation to the required five foot minimum side setback requirement of administrative rules attached accessory structure, air conditioning units, and pool equipment to allow the air conditioning unit to be set back 
feet from the west side property line and a 2.5 foot 50% deviation to the required five foot minimum side setback requirement of administrative rules, attached accessory structure, air conditioner unit, AC and pool equipment to allow the pool equipment to be set back 2.5 feet from the west side property line. And the applicants are Ricardo and Jennifer Trevino. Section 2.1B4 of the 2006 LDC authorizes the Land Use Administrator to establish administrative rules for the application and implementation of the LDC. The City Attorney provided opinion that a deviation to the administrative rule is a deviation to the LDC. The subject property is located at 1017 Pearson Drive. The property has a future land use designation of plan unit development and also a zoning district of plan unit development. The subject property is located in Alafaya Woods PUD in the residential medium density section of the development. The PUD zoning is governed by amended and restated zoning classification agreement through ordinance number 1244, adopted on May 19, 2003. Residential structures are not covered in ordinance number 1244, therefore the land Development code and administrative rule for attached accessory structures, air conditioner units, and pool equipment was applied for this deviation request. The applicant wishes to place the pool equipment and keep the existing air conditioner unit on the west side of the principal building structure. The proposed pool equipment and existing AC unit are 2.5 feet away from the west side property line, and they encroach 2.5 feet into the minimum required five, five foot side setback. The applicant has submitted an application and that was provided to you in Exhibit 2 and also their criteria that they addressed. The applicant is applying for a deviation to allow for the pool equipment and existing AC unit to be located 2.5 feet from the west side property line and the applicant has requested to place the proposed pool equipment on a 3x3 pad adjacent to the existing AC unit on the west side of the home. The applicant is also willing to provide a shade tree as mitigation. Staff reviewed the application and information presented by the application is below and the following was found. Exist, existence of special conditions. The lot is a re rectangular shape. The square footage of the lot is 5,538 square feet. The principal building structure is set back from both side property lines at five feet. Located in the rear of the property is a 10 foot utility easement and the property is surrounded by existing six foot fence. The air conditioning pool pool equipment compatibility. The setback of the proposed pool equipment and existing air conditioning unit have been designed to be placed on a three by three pad. Some of the mitigated techniques that the applicant proposes is to retain the existing fence and also plant a shade tree on the property. The request is a minimum request for the air conditioner unit and pool equipment and this is the minimum necessary that they would like. Uh, open space will not be affected. The applicant meets the 25% uh, minimum requirement of open space. And for as for other information, the applicant has provided a statement from the homeowner located to the west of the subject property, and the homeowner stated that they do not have any issues or foresee any problems with the installation of the pool equipment located on the west side of the property. It is recommended that the LPA approve the following deviations with the conditions as listed below. A 2.5 foot 50% deviation to the required five foot minimum side setback requirement of administrative rules attached accessory structures, air conditioner units and pool equipment to allow the air condition unit, AC unit to be set, to be set 2.5 feet from the west side property line and a 2.5 foot 50% deviation to the required five foot minimum side setback requirement administrative rules attached accessory structure, air conditioner units and pool equipment to allow the pool equipment to be set back 2.5 feet from the west property line. In the conditions that would be added to this request, the applicant shall retain and maintain the existing fence and plant a shade tree on the property. The LPA has the following options. You may approve the deviation as submitted or approve the deviation as submitted with conditions or approve the deviation as recommended by staff or approve a lesser deviation or approve a deviation with conditions or deny the deviation. 
This concludes staff's presentation and we are available for questions. Thank you. Are there any questions of staff? I have one. Mr. Lopez? Um, you recommended a shade tree be planted? Yes. Since the property lines are so close, wouldn't the roots eventually go and corrupt some of the foundation? It may, depending on where they're placing the shade tree. It hasn't been determined yet where they're placing it. Okay. Do you I mean, I recommend? It's important to find out where they're going to place it. Okay. It does not have to be placed on the same side of um, where the deviation is going, where the AC and the, um, yep. the other structure is going. It can go anywhere on the property. I understand that, but most of those property lines are pretty tight to begin with. They and are. any shade tree is going to grow quite large. I, I mean, that's my only concern that we may be pushing, putting the homeowners at more risk. Are there any other questions of staff? Madam Chair, uh, I, I had a couple questions. I mean, one was in regards to the shade tree. How did the shade tree even come up? It, I mean, what was, what's it there to mitigate against? Well, it's there to, it's part of mitigation as far as allowing to have the pool equipment there for their request. A shade tree doesn't exactly have to be there, but if they, that they said they would like to put a shade tree there, if you see there's another um, item that you would want to put there, you think would be best to be put there, then um, I feel that you all may suggest that, if you would like, because I understand what you're asking about the shade tree, but it would probably provide mitigation, possibly depending on where it is. Also, um, Land Development Code um, Section 2.7C, one of the items, one of the criteria that has to be addressed by the applicant is the proper use of mitigative techniques. And that is also provided for in your staff memo. So it's something that needs to be addressed by the applicant. Is the applicant, since the city is granting or may grant the deviation, what are you willing to um, provide in, at, in exchange for the deviation, in exchange for um, allowing um, the AC unit to be as close as it is to the property line. So it's a criteria that is inside of your staff memo. It's also part of the land development code. Um, so it's something that needs to be addressed by the applicant. It does not have to be a shade tree. It could be um, as simple as, I think the next one we're requiring that the um, shed be painted the same color as the house and that the shingles are the same color as the house. It does not need to be a shade tree, but we do require that they address mitigative techniques. They just have to address it? Yes. Okay. Um, my other question is, is on the, on the AC unit, um, apparently that was installed and inspected and the inspection was approved and, and nothing ever happened back then? That it, I mean, because it wasn't in compliance back then either, was it? To my understanding, it was not in compliance from my <coughs> research, but it was there since 1987. So this is to bring it to up to code. Okay. Um. And what happens is because the, the rules have changed, the code has changed, it becomes a nonconforming structure. And so with the deviation, it establishes a new setback for that AC unit, and it becomes conforming. What, was the setback for AC units back in, in 87 when it was placed there, were, were they, was there a different setback back then? From research, there was um, the, the ordinance that established, the development agreement that established, it expired. So when it expired, it went back, reverted to the code that's present. Well, it went to the code that's present at this time right now. So that's why it's being... Um, reviewed against today's code because of the de expired uh, ordinance. The, the code that it was under, was, was it in compliance under that code? It was under the development agreement, under a development agreement for ordinance 12.44, but um, for the code, I, it was going by the development agreement, so I wouldn't know at this time right now if it was up to date on the code, but it was in compliance with the development agreement when they established it. So it was in compliance? It, from was there a permit issue at that time? There was not a permit issue. I believe it's when they built the homes. That's how it was issued. That's how they okay. were. So there was, um, Tara did research to determine if there was ever a permit issued for that AC unit. And she was not able to find any permits 
um, through her research to say that there, it was ever permitted. Um, and so now the AC unit, when we're looking at deviations, we look at all the issues on the property. What um, nonconformities are there on the property? Um, and as, we sta as I stated at the last um, LPA meeting, when we're looking at these deviations, we have to bring the entire property into compliance. And so because Tara wasn't able to find a permit for that AC unit, um, it is, we consider it a nonconforming use. So since he was getting a deviation for the pool um, um, equipment, we decided that he should go ahead and get a, a deviation for the AC unit as well to bring everything into compliance with the code. Okay. <clears throat> Are there any other questions of staff? Okay. This is a public meeting item, so there's no um, public hearing on it. What's the board's pleasure? Madam Chair. Mr. Pollack? I would uh, like to make a motion to recommend uh, de the deviation at 1017 Pearson Drive. Um, as stated, with the exception of the shade tree um, being required, um, as long as the, just the condition, the, the, that part of the condition should be removed. The, the rest of it should be there with maintaining the fence. I'll second it. Okay, Mr. Lopez. I'll second it. Mr. Wright. Um, I, I, if you don't mind, I think the motion was to recommend approval. I think we are the approving board in this case, are we not? Oh, sorry. To, yes, okay, we so, are. Sorry so to, we to, to correct that. Make a motion to approve. Sorry. Okay. And second. <clears throat> To approve without the condition of the of tree recommended by staff. Yeah. Okay. And Mr. Lopez, that's your second. I'm correct. Okay. Is there any discussion on the motion? Uh, I had Mr. I, Pollock. I'm sorry, Madam Chair. Um, I had one question, or not one question, just one discussion item. Um, we're approving this deviation for this AC unit. Um, I understand that it was grandfathered in. Um, is this going to open, you know, open up, you know, a lot of? Because I mean. I know all the properties in my neighborhood, all the AC units are required to be in the back. We have five foot setbacks. There's no way our AC units could be on the side of the house. I know it's in a lot of neighborhoods in Oviedo. Is this going to open it up to, you know, to, to be, you know, consistent treatment across the board? I, I concur. I mean, are we open Pandora's box? No, yes. you're not. We're not going out and looking at these single family homes in that neighborhood to see who's AC unit is on the side of the house. We're not doing that. Because they came, the applicant came with a deviation request is when we decided to take a look at it. No, so no. it's not setting a precedent um, with us going out and initiating any type of code enforcement action. I, I wasn't looking at a code enforcement action. I was, you know, concerned with individuals um, uh, wanting now to put all their AC units on the side of the house, you know, and, and them coming in for deviations. Uh, for those, um, you know, we're we're we're, set, we're setting a precedent here to allow that, and for you know for someone to come in now, I find that I find that that would you know potentially be you know difficult to reject at that point. I'm not understanding what you're saying. I'm sorry. No, well, I guess what he's trying to say is all right. So. If the original it wasn't originally approved, now we've approved one for the side, and someone may come now and found out that we've done a deviation for that air conditioner on the side. How many people might come back now and apply for that deviation? And we've set a precedence now that we are allowing it. I think that's where my allowing it on the side or allowing right. it two on, feet, two point well, five feet. On, well, most of those houses in that area are <coughs> are shotgun houses. They're zero lot lines. So yeah, you know, so it will have to be. In the same criteria, so I, I think that's what Mr. Pollock is trying to uh, encompass. Am I correct? Am I yes. Putting words in your mouth. So how do we how do we protect ourselves and the city as a, as a whole? Okay, so the administrative rule says that the AC unit and pool equipment may be located on the side or behind the rear wall of the principal building structure of a residential lot. And then it talks about AC units and pool equipment located behind the rear wall, rear wall of the principal structure shall meet the setback of five feet from the rear and side property lines. So it's already there that you can have it on the side and you can have it on the rear. It just has to be five feet from the property line. 
So um, I guess I'm not following the precedent Madam, setting. Madam Chair. Mr. Sheridan. I, I think one of the big differences here is this air conditioner was already on the side of the house. And I don't think we're opening Pandora's box for somebody behind who's got a rear AC to come in and talk to us about putting their AC on the side of the house. And they and can put it on the side, right. And, and they can, but that's already out there. Any of them can do that at yes. this point would have to come in. Absolutely. Th this one's already there, and all we're doing is bringing them up into current code. Exactly. Yes. Now, if somebody was to come in who had a, a rear air conditioner and wanted to put it on the side, I, I think we have legitimate questions at that point. Why do we want to do this? What are we doing this for? Um, but I, I don't know that this is opening Pandora's box, so to speak, for what the question is. Anytime you grant a deviation, you're opening Pandora's box for any use. You have a ton of deviations that come in for the same thing. We, we see the boat docks. I don't know if you remember the boat docks that used to come in all the time. Every time you granted one deviation, it came back again because they wanted the deviations. So it's, it's not that you are granting something that um, no one else can have access to. You're granting something that you have the authority to do. Unfortunately, this person, we couldn't find a permit for this person. And so the setback today is five feet and he's 2.5. So you're just bringing that <coughs> AC unit into compliance with today's code. It's not setting a precedent. Well, and the, the unit was obviously permitted at some point or it never would have been built. So somebody's lost the permit somewhere along the way. But and that the, could the, have happened. it was obviously permitted back in 87. Otherwise, it never would have been built. Are there any other discussion points on this? No, Chair. Mr. Wright? <clears throat> it's, it's more of a, just a, I'm asking the question of the board, and Mr. Paul <clears throat> specifically. Um, it, the deviation we, we've, in the past, we've always looked at mitigative techniques. I'm kind of more interested in why you feel like this one doesn't require that. That's really, I'm just looking for an answer for that. The, the, the fence, to me, I, I the fence maintenance to me was was mitigation enough I, I if you I mean looking at the the property itself trying like uh, mr. Lopez had said trying to find a place to put a shade tree on that property especially <coughs> with the the construction of a new pool um, it, it's 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 not you know and it's not there that tree is not going to mitigate the pool equipment um, you know, if you, you know, from a visual standpoint, it may be a bush, but the, the shade tree, it's, it's just more of a penalty. You're just penalizing the homeowner for asking for the deviation. Yeah, and that, you answered the question yeah. perfectly, because that really the word, you know, I think the, the technique that we're supposed to use is that it's supposed to provide some mitigated technique so that it, it doesn't cause an adverse <coughs> to adjacent owners and stuff. So I guess I was really just want to be clear that, you know, because there is a fence there and that's why we're doing it. Right. Not just because you just don't think you should have a tree. That's, right. that's kind of what's right. 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 No, no. Just Madam Chair. Mr. Sheridan. Just real quick to expand on that a little bit. Fast forward 20 years, having put a shade tree by the pool and trying to sell a home, I wound up having to fix a cracked pipe and fix a cracked deck where the shade tree wound up going under the piping and the deck and cracking the pipe, but to be able to sell the house, it cost me another $1,500 to fix all of that. So to, I, I agree with removing the shade tree wholeheartedly in this situation. Is there some reason the shade tree can't go in the front yard? It can go anywhere on the property. It can't go in the front yard. And it's not mitigating so the, 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 I'm. I don't think the mitigation here is to muffle the sound or do anything about the pool equipment. It's when someone comes in and asks for something extra that other people don't, they're giving back something, in this case, planting a tree. Am yes. I on yes. the right? Yes, you are. Okay. But the, Madam Chair. Mr. Wright. I, you know, again, just to, not for, not to say for argument, but, you know, if you look at number three, which is the, the list of deviation for special existence of special conditions. Which page are you on? Um, it would be on our uh, page numbers don't come up, but um, page three, I guess it would be in the report of this item. Specifically, uh, item three, where <coughs> in the table where it says proper use of mitigative techniques, 
Basically, the definition that we're given here is that the proposed development project has been designed to incorporate and mitigate techniques needed to prevent adverse impacts to adjacent land use activities. In this case, the fence is providing that the tree, whether it's in the front yard, is not going to really apply to that. But, and that's kind of the definition I was looking for when I asked okay. Mr. Pollock that it meets that definition. It wasn't just for the fact he didn't think they needed a tree for the sake of having a tree. That, that's kind of what I was looking at, and that's how I applied it. So. So it doesn't necessarily understand what you're asking and what staff has said about not, you know, if they've asked for something in excess, you know, the effort to give something back, that's not really what that definition says, you know, that you have to give something to get something. So it basically just says that we use that technique to provide if there's going to be an adverse effect. Okay. And please don't let that bite me later in the, you know what. <laughs> yeah, because you're next. <laughs> you're next. You live by it, you die by it, right? <laughs> I've got an answer. We're feisty today. Is there any other discussion? Please, no. <laughs> Mr. Young, you've been awfully quiet. Do you have anything? I'm good on this one. Okay. <laughs> okay, seeing none, we'll call the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. So that's one. <clears throat> Motion carries. Good luck with your poll. Next item on the agenda is deviation for 2300 Pine Brook Court. <laughs> is Madam the applicant Chair, here? Madam Chair. Mr. Wright. I am the applicant. I will have to recuse myself from the dais to present and not participate in this portion of our meeting. Okay. He's done. Madam Chair, I think we should really look at the mitigative techniques. On oh, absolutely. This next line. Oh, I'm sure that we're going to have to look at those. We're carefully. feisty tonight. He's yeah, in there trouble. Was a, there was a hard line there where I was saying, do I say something? Because this is coming <laughs> <up to me." laughs> Madam Chair, members of the board, my name is Larry Wright, I live at 23300 Pinebrook Court, Oviedo 32766 in the Riverside subdivision. I'm here tonight because I have an application in for a request for a deviation for my property for the installation of a shed or construction of a shed. Um, <clears throat> the devi there is actually two deviations incorporated on this. Um, there are several items in your book that show the site plan. Um, what I'm looking for specifically is the construction of a six and a half foot by 12 foot shed sitting on a concrete deck on a, on a pad. And what I'd like to do is put it in my rear yard adjacent to my existing patio features. Um, I have a, currently the case based on the code, I have a five foot setback requirement for any type of accessory structures. One of the things that we look at is the existence of existing conditions. Um, several things on my property do have existing conditions that don't occur on any of the other lots within my subdivision. Um, our standard lot front setback is 25 foot. Um, 20 years ago, we are the original owners, constructed it in 93. I really didn't pay attention at the time and realized that they had actually built the house back another foot in foot point 1.1. 1. 1. So, so they've reduced my rear yard setback by about 1.04 1. feet or so. Um, the deviation I'm asking for in the rear um, is it's on a slant, so it, it's basically 0 0.93 to 1.4 feet. Um, the 1.4 feet is the maximum deviation that I'm asking for at 28% uh, into that rear five foot setback. In addition, since my house sits on the intersection of Twin Rivers Boulevard and Pinebrook Court, I'm considered a corner lot line. So my side yard property adjacent to the street side is subject to a 25 foot setback, just like my front. Um, what I've asked is to slide the shed over four feet into that setback, accounting for about a 16% deviation. Um, the reason for this is really aesthetics and, and location. Um, my existing patio features, if I slide it any further, I basically have a conflict opening a door. Um, so I've asked to slide it over slightly so that I can have door without a post hitting it. So um, I've included uh, multiple photos. I've given the clerk some additional supplemental information. Um, as far as mitigative techniques, that was one of the things that was brought up to my, um, during the compliance review. Um, one of the other existing conditions on my property is that my house and the property itself is subject to an encroachment by the city right away in the city street. Um, the sidewalk and the parkway on my northern, northeastern property line, um, my property corner sits at the inside edge of the sidewalk adjacent to the street. At the front side, my sidewalk and the curb of the road, actually, my property corner is in the curb. So I have a approximate 12-foot encroachment on my front side, 5-foot on the other side. 
Um, we looked at mitigative techniques because um, they asked about the potential of putting a tree on there. Um, my yard is heavily landscaped. I have uh, nine queen palms mature. I have a full 24 inch oak in the front that covers the entire yard. And as far as mitigative techniques, my neighbor echoes what was spoken earlier on the other one. He decided to plant trees along the rear property line, right on the property line. So he has three full mature trees that really overhang halfway over my pool at this point. Um, I have a six foot privacy fence. Um, some of the pictures that you can see, especially from the street side, um, the shed is would be in a, in a sense behind all of that landscape and stuff. Um, uh, at the other side of it, the last side of the existing conditions is that since my house sits on a, a block of about eight houses back to back that are contiguous to the uh, conservation area up along the econ. Um, there is a little bit of a fall in my rear property. So the back rear corner where my property is, I have approximately, I think it's 2.8 or almost 3 feet of fall. Um, that place also is very moist. Um, I've lived there for 20 years. I've planted multiple trees back there. At one point I had five palms back there, and there's still only one that survives because the, the moisture in the ground just basically eats the roots up and they, they will die. So um, that would have been the only place that I could have put a tree. They asked about putting it on the right of way. I can't, I only have about six inches from the sidewalk because of that encroachment. So there really isn't anything on there unless I was to remove my existing landscaping. So in this case, uh, what I've asked is basically no mitigation as far as trees. At that point, that's really my presentation. I'm available for any questions. Are there any Seeing questions? None, we'll, oh, sorry. <laughs> I, I have a question <laughs> of the applicant. The, uh, Mr. Pollock. The, the roof line of this shed, will it be seen from the street? Yes. Um, it would be slightly that, uh, if you look in the pictures, uh, I'll give you an example, there is an existing uh, pergola in the back. Mm -hmm. um, it would be just at or just about that same height, so yes, it would be. Okay. Any other questions, Mr. Pollard? No. And there is, um, like I said, if you want to look at the supplemental stuff, uh, uh, there's a photo two that I gave you on the second to last page. It's kind of a view from my back porch looking to the neighbor's yard. Um, really, the like I said, the shed would be just at that shed. is pergola is about 10 foot at its peak, and I think the shed's about 9.3. Are there any other questions of the applicant? Thank you. Thank you. May we hear from staff? Thank you, Madam Chair. This is a request for the local planning agency to approve the following deviations listed below. A 1.4 foot 28% deviation to require five foot minimum rear setback requirement of LDC section 4.15A2 detached residential accessory structure requirements to allow the construction of a shed with a medium setback of 3.60 feet and a four foot 16% deviation to the required 25 feet street side setback. LDC section 4.15 A3 detached residential accessory structures required to allow the construction of a shed with a minimum corner lot street side setback of 21 feet. The applicant and owners are Larry and Joanna Wright. The requested four foot deviation to the required 25 feet set, side setback to LDC section 4.15 A3 detached residential accessory structure requirement represents a 16% deviation. The 16% deviation may be approved at st staff level, but is, in staff's opinion, it should be considered in tandem with the 29% deviation. The subject property is located at 2300 Pine Brook Court in the Riverside development in the Trend Rivers subdivision. The property has a future land designation of plan unit development and is located in a plan unit development zoning district. The plan, the PUD zoning district is governed by a zoning classification agreement through ordinance number 519, adopted June 2nd, 1986. Residential accessory structures are not covered by ordinance number 519, therefore the current land development code is applied for the deviation request. The applicant wishes to place a shed to the rear and side of the principal structure. The proposed shed is 3.04 feet away from the rear property line, encroaching 1.4 feet into the rear setback required five feet minimum. 
Also, the proposed shed is 21 feet from the, si the street side corner lot property line, encroaching four feet into the required 25 feet setback. The applicant, the staff has reviewed the applicant, the applicant's application, and the information is presented below and also in your exhibits that were provided. Ex existing of special conditions, the lot is a rectangle shape. The property has two street frontages, Pinebrook Court and Twin Rivers Boulevard, and is considered a corner lot. A four-foot side walk encroaches approximately nine feet onto the subject property. In the rear and on the side of the subject property are t a 10-foot utility easement. The property is surrounded by a six-foot wooden fence. A six-foot tall hedge is also located adjacent to the east property line. The compat compatibility of the shed, um, the proposed location of the shed is to the rear of the principal building structure. The shed is an accessory use and is proportionate to the principal building structure. Thus, the proposed de deviation scale intensity are compatible with and will not adversely impact land uses activities on adjacent properties. The location of the six foot wood fence and six foot tall hedges on the east side of the property will act as a buffer for the proposed shed. The proposed prop mitigation techniques, the applicant proposes the color of the shed will be neutral and earth tone. The shingles of the proposed shed will be the same as the existing principal building structure. The existing six foot fence surrounding the lot will remain. This is the a medium, request, medium deviation request. Um, the requested 1.4 deviation to require five foot medium rear setback requirement um, provided in LDC section 4.15A2 detached residential accessory structure requirements and the requested four foot 16% deviation to the corner lot street side setback, LDC section 4.15A3, detached residential accessory structure requirements are the minimum deviation necessary. The open space, the applicant exceeds the open space requirement. He'll actually have 53% um, left of open space on his property when um, providing the, putting the shed on the property. It is recommended that the LP, LPA approve the following deviations with the conditions stated below. A 1.4 foot 28% deviation to require five foot minimum rear setback requirement of LDC section 4.15A2 detached asset, residential accessory structure requirements to allow the construction of a shed with a minimum setback of 3.60 feet and a four foot 16% deviation to require 25 feet st street side setback, LDC section 4.15A3, detached residential accessory structures requirements to allow the construction of shed with a minimum corner lot street side setback of 21 feet. Um, the conditions that the, for the applicant, the applicant shall provide a shed with exterior colors and shingles matching the principal building structure. Um, you may, the LPA um, has the following options. Approve the deviation as submitted or approve the deviation as submitted with conditions or approve the deviation as recommended by staff or approve a lesser deviation or approve a deviation with conditions or deny the devi deviation. Thank you and this concludes staff's presentation and we are available for any questions that you may have. Thank you. Are there questions of staff? Madam Chair. Mr. Sheridan. Um, without potentially making this harder than it needs to be, um, and this may actually be a question from Mr. Cobb while he's here. With all the changes we've made recently, do we actually have the ability to approve the 16% deviation? That's not under our board's purview. That's under another board. What we do with, oh, I'm sorry. No, I, <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. No, I said with, maybe with, Mr. Cobb. With the deviations, what we do is um, we look at the greatest amount, the greatest amount of the deviation, and the greatest amount deviation would determine which board approves it. So if he had 10, 5 percent deviation and one okay. deviation over 21 percent, they would all go before the um, planning, local planning agency. Any other questions? Nothing? So, 
if we deny this, then he could build the, um, he could still install the shed if it's about four feet by six feet or something, right? If we just make it he much would, smaller? Yes. Yeah, but he would still need to meet the five foot setback. Right. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, um, this is not a public meeting item, so there's no, I mean, it is a public meeting item, so there's no hearing on it. What's the board's pleasure? Madam Chair. Mr. Pollack? Um, I would like to make a motion to approve the deviation at 2300 Pine Brook Court um, as uh, submitted, um, or deviation as recommended by staff. With the condition recommended by staff? Okay. Is there a second? second? Mr. Lopez? Is there any discussion? Okay, we'll call the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. You got your shed. Good luck with your project, sir. <laughs> Okay, next item on the agenda is public hearing item for ordinance number 1637, the statutory development agreement for the signage master plan. I'm a veto on the park. Thank you, Madam Chair. We do have an applicant that's here, Mr. Um, Cavanaugh with PAC um, Land Development. He is here. So I don't know if you want to start first, and it's a joint application it's both the city and um, PAC I can begin and he can come in okay so I'll go ahead and just provide the introductions of it and take you through it and then if there are any questions we do have Tom Cavanaugh and Brian Cobb in the audience so I'll do that okay so this is a request for the LPA to recommend adoption of a statutory development agreement um, and associated signage master plan for the Oviedo on the park. This SDA, which I'm going to refer to it as SDA, addresses signage for the Oviedo on the park property, generally located on the north side of Mitchell Hammock Road, east side of City Plaza Way, south side of Center Lake Lane, and west side of Oviedo Boulevard. And it is shown in Exhibit A of your package. If you'll turn to Exhibit a, we'll take a look at it, and it is on page, it looks like this. Is Tara over there? It looks like this. It's Exhibit A. And you'll see what properties this development agreement applies to, and you'll also see what's not included into the, prop, into the signage master plan. So if you're looking at Exhibit A, which is um, on the screen, you'll see that it's um, the area where it does apply to, but you'll also see Lots 1 and um, Lots 2, which is going to be your Starbucks and Chipotle. Those two properties are not included into um, the signage master plan, but all the other properties surrounding it is, which is north of Mitchell Hammock on the west side of Oviedo Boulevard, south of Center Lake Lane, and east of City Plaza Way. Okay, so the proposed SDA and associated signage master plan is consistent with Land Development Code Section 6.4548I, which provides the purpose and the criteria for an alternative signage plan. The master plan provides for the style copy design size, materials, and locations of all signs within the subject property. The highlights of the Oviedo on the Park master sign plan are as follows. It allows certain types of private signs within the city right-of-way, such as sandwich board signs, post signs, temporary attention getting signs, and temporary directional signs associated with the leasing trailer, and we will go through each one of those signs. It also allows for private signs um, to be located on private property. It requires private signs to be located on private property, set back two feet from the right of way. And those signs are the coming soon, now leasing, now open, leasing signs, construction signs, attention getting devices, multi-tenant sign A, multi-tenant sign B, 
apartment ground mounted sign, on site coming soon, now open leasing sign, and coming soon, now open leasing signs associated with a leasing trailer. If you will turn to page one of your master sign plan, we're going to talk about the coming soon signs. Okay, so your coming soon signs are going to be the green signs that are located um, just north of Mitchell Hammock Road, and you'll see, um, I can't see here, but you'll see them. They're the, um, it's one, two, three, four, five, six signs that's located on uh, Mitchell Hammock Road. And those signs, the coming soon signs, it can be the coming soon now le open leasing signs that announce New commercial tenants are coming soon or now open. Commercial space and residential units within the Strand are coming soon for lease or now open. Commercial space and residential units within the Strand are coming soon for lease or now open. Residential units within Park Place Apartments are for lease. Um, if you look at page eight, if you go to page eight of the master sign plan, you'll see what these signs look like. Page eight. Uh, one more page. I, I can't really see the page numbers there. Do you see page eight? It's. I think it's before that. You have to go back up. <coughs> okay. Well, you can see it on the end. The coming soon now, coming <coughs> soon now, open leasing signs. You'll see it there. But there's a um, sheet on page eight in your agreement. It's, it's that one. That's what it looks like. This allows for a maximum of six coming soon signs, now, now open leasing signs. The signs must be removed within 30 days after the expiration of the last now open commercial tenant sign parcel or leasing sign panel for the strand or strand two or by September 30th, 2022, whichever occurs first. Each coming soon sign can be converted to a now open or leasing sign. All coming soon now open leasing signs shall include the Oviedo on the Park panel sign at the top, which you see on that sign, of all the signs at all times. The minimum size of the Oviedo on the Park panel sign shall be one foot by three inches by five feet, four inches. And the next sign is going to be your construction sign. If you go back to page one, that would be great. So the construction signs are going to be your um, blue, your, on there it's like a light blue sign. And those are your construction locations. It's, it's at the corner of Mitchell Hammock and um, City Walk Lane. And you also have some at the corner of Oviedo Boulevard and Mike Roberto Way. Those are the, um, it's like a lighter, not the turquoise looking one. It's the darker blue underneath that turquoise one at Mitchell Hammock Road. Those are the construction signs. And in the, right, in the um, agreement, it says a maximum of four construction signs may be, installed, may be installed on the subject property. One construction sign may be installed on each side of City Walk Lane at its intersection with Mitchell Hammock Road or each side of Mike Roberto Way at its intersection with Oviedo Boulevard, whichever is designated as the construction entrance for the project. If you turn to page nine, you can see what um, that construction sign looks like. Okay, so that's what the construction sign looks like. And the construction sign shall be removed from the subject premise 
within 10 days of the issuance of a certificate of occupancy for the project depicted on the sign. Construction signs for the strand shall be removed within 10 days of the issuance of the last certificate of occupancy. All construction signs shall include a veto on the park panel, sign panel at the top of the sign at all times. Okay, so then the next one is going to be your sandwich board. Your sandwich board signs. Um, if you look at page one, you'll see this, this, I'm sorry, you're just going back and forth. We're always going to go to page one whenever we're showing the location of the signs. You should have it in your package as well. Okay, so the sandwich board signs are going to be the red. It should be, you'll see the red locations on the sandwich board signs. And they're all along City Plaza Way, City Walk Lane. Um, you'll see that's the location of the um, sandwich board. So it says sandwich boards may be placed a maximum of two feet um, from the front wall or window of the building, cannot block pedestrian traffic, sidewalks, walkways, pathways, driveways, or parking spaces, and may be placed during business hours and must be taken in at the close of business each day. And it says each tenant shall be allowed a maximum of one sandwich board per tenant, um, per tenant street frontage. So if there is a building that is located on a corner, they will be able to get two sandwich boards because it has two frontages. The next one is going to be, and I'm sorry, the, the way those look is on page 10. So if you go to page 10, you'll be able to see the sandwich board. And that's what the sandwich board looks like. Okay, so the next one is going to be your attention getting device. Page one, again, will show you the locations of the attention getting devices. And those are going to be your dark blue areas, which is going to be your turquoise areas on there. So you'll see those locations there, the attention getting devices. Okay, the language says the strand, strand two, and, and the hotel use may install a maximum of three structured vertical banners for each, each for six months immediately after the issuance of the certificate of occupancy at approved locations. One alternative attention getting device may be installed in lieu of three structured vertical banners upon city council approval. All other locations provided in Exhibit B may install one structure vertical banner with the issuance of a special event permit. The special event permit, the special event must require the closure of one or more of the following roadways, City Plaza Way, City Walk Lane, Mike Roberto Way, and or City Lake Lane. And the attention getting devices will be found on page 11. And you'll see the structured vertical banner there, and that's what the attention getting device must look like. Anything other than that has to be approved by city council. Okay, so your next one is going to be the post signs, and these are not going to be your directional signs. They're going to tell people what's in the immediate area. So if you look at page two, you'll see the locations of where they are allowed. You have um, two types of post signs, but one is the, the city post signs and the other is um, private post signs. So the, you'll see the, it's um, like a burgundy B is going to be the private and then the blue B is going to be the city. Um, signs, post signs. So you'll see the locations there. All the, you'll see the B's. 
the burgundy bee and the light blue bee. Those are the locations. And page 16 is where you'll see what it looks like. So the language says post signs are allowed at approved locations as described in exhibit B. Post signs shall include the Oviedo on the Park sign panel at the top of the sign. So you'll see um, the burgundy bee and then you'll also see the blue bee, which is a burgundy is a private, blue is the city. Your next sign is going to be your directional sign. And the directional locations or directional sign locations are found on page one. And you'll see like the um, pink boxes. I think it's going to look pink on there. Yeah, you're going to see the pink boxes. And that's where the directional signs can be located. Um, page 14 is where you will see the type of sign, directional sign, that you can have. The language says for directional signs, it says the property owner may install five directional signs on the Strand property to provide guidance to the leasing office located in Building 1A. The directional signs shall be removed within 18 months after the issuance of a certificate of occupancy for the leasing office or by September 30th. 2022, whichever occurs first. The maximum sign area is four square feet and a maximum height of four feet. So you'll see the smaller sign is the directional sign. Okay, so then the next one is going to be the leasing trailer. If you look on page four, page four will have the location of the leasing trailer area. And the leasing trailer will go somewhere in that area. It's the blue area that is highlighted on there. The leasing air, um, trailer will go somewhere in that area. <clears throat> so the leasing trailer says the property owner may convert one of the coming soon, now open leasing signs located east of City Walk Lane and west of Oviedo Boulevard into two single face leasing signs for the Strand and Strand 2. And if you'll turn to page 14, it'll show you the type of sign. And you'll see um, the coming soon, but you'll see the V shaped as well. And that's the type of sign that can be, um, one of the, the now leasing signs can be converted into. It says each sign area shall have a maximum area of 32.25 square feet and a maximum height of 8 feet 9 inches. The property owner may install a maximum of four structured vertical banners described and depicted on Exhibit B. Each structured banner shall be a rectangular in shape with a maximum area of 45 square feet and a maximum length of 15 feet, maximum width of 3 feet, and a maximum height of 17 feet. The property owner may install five directional signs as described in Exhibit B. These signs shall have a maximum area of four square feet and a maximum height of four feet. And that's going to be the directional sign that's on there and the structured banners as well. Temporary signs and banners shall be removed at the same time as the leasing trailer is removed. The owner plans to place a leasing trailer on the subject property. After the issuance of a building permit, the owner may install one wall banner with a maximum of 160 square feet, maximum length of 40 feet, and a maximum width of 4 feet. The banner shall be removed 18 months after the issuance of a certificate of occupancy for the leasing office located in Building 1A of the Strand or by September 30th, 2022, whichever occurs first. The existing leasing sign for Park Place Apartments, which is already there, it's already existing, must be removed within 30 days of the execution of this development agreement. And then the development agreement talks about the signs not addressed, and it says signs not addressed in the statutory development agreement and associated signage master plan for a veto in the park shall comply with the city's land development code. We also have a section that talks about public benefits. And um, it says, within 30 days of execution of the development agreement, the property owner shall grant the city permanent and perpetual easements 
or at the owner's election fee title within the areas outside of public right of way determined by the city and property owner to be reasonably necessary for maintenance and repair of city signs by plat dedication or written agreement. And then there's also language that talks about the impact fee credit agreement that was entered into on by with the property owner in which the property owner granted um, in which the city granted the property owner $223,250 in recreation and park impact fee credits for the property owner's fabrication and installation of the signs listed in your staff report, which, is, which would include the entry signs, post signs, amphitheater ground mounted signs, city walk, city parks, I'm sorry, city lake park ground mounted signs, the columns and arch for the arch banner, and city signs, and those signs are also in your um, report. And they start on page 15 of the report, and, you, and I've gone through most of them, but they'll say city signs at the top of the, um, the plan. And you'll, if you wanna go to page 15, So you, page 15. So this is gonna be your entry sign. Um, the next sign is gonna be your post sign, the city post sign, which is um, the blue, which is on page 16. That one is one of the ones that he was granted impact fee credits for. The next one is gonna be on on page 21, which is the amphitheater ground mounted signage. Which is that one. And then the next one is the next page, which is the city lake Park ground mounted sign. And then the next one is gonna be page 23, which is gonna be the city arch banner. And then the next one is page 24, which is the city sign. And then 25. Oh, yeah, just 24. That's it, 24. Okay, so the property owner shall also fabricate and install the signs listed concurrently with the construction of the infrastructure for lot 3B and lot 4 of Oviedo of the, on the Park preliminary subdivision plan approved by the City Council on October 15, 2015. The city will be responsible for maintaining all signs and any easement area in which the city sign is located. The property owner will be responsible for maintaining all private signs and temporary signs. And then um, we've talked about the city signs and um, the description of the city signs, but it, um, the description includes, we'll go through it again. So it includes a maximum of one double-sided amphitheater ground-mounted sign will be installed along City Lake Lane. The maximum sign area is 11.72 square feet with a maximum sign height of nine feet one inch. A maximum of two double-sided City Lake Park ground-mounted signs will be installed along City Center Lake Lane and City Plaza Way. The maximum sign area is 11.75 square feet with a maximum sign height of nine feet one inch. The city arch banner will be hung from the vehicular gateway arch over city walk lane, a maximum sign area of 50 square feet. The banner is to serve as a temporary announcement of community events at Center Lake Park. Mm -hmm. Then also a maximum of two city signs will be mounted on central fence panels on the frontage wall fence along Mitchell Hammock Road. The maximum sign area is 45 square feet with a maximum height of three feet six inches. This sign is to serve as an announcement to Center Lake Park. 
The sandwich board is a temporary double-sided chalkboard sign to announce community events in Center Lake Park. These signs are allowed in multiple locations as depicted in the master sign plan. The maximum sign area is 3.6 square feet. The maximum sign height is three feet. The city attention getting devices are to be placed within Center Lake Park, Lot 5, and other approved locations within Oviedo and the park. These temporary devices can be erected a maximum of 30 days before an event and removed immediately following the event. These devices shall be rectangular with a maximum area of 45 square feet and a maximum height of 15 feet. City Council will conduct first reading of Ordinance Number 1637 at its May 2, 2016 meeting and conduct a public hearing and consider adoption of Ordinance 1637 at its May 16, 2016 meeting. It is recommended that the local planning agency recommend adoption of Ordinance 1637. And as I mentioned before, we have um, Tom Cavanaugh in the audience and we also have the city manager, Brian Cobb, in the audience. And we can all try to address any of your questions. This concludes my presentation, and we're available for questions. Thank you. Are there any questions of staff? Madam Chair. Mr. Young. Um, I have a question regarding the placement for the uh, temporary banner signage. It is kind of generally located, I know, in the exhibits here on the corners, but during the permit issuance for that, or, or whatever review takes place, are they going to get a little bit more specific? I know that there's two feet from the right of it, but can, at those corners it can still cause visibility issues. Um, you know, three foot wide, 15 foot tall banner. Are you going to be looking at sight triangles for any of that? Or? We will take that into consideration, yes. We will make sure that there, there is not a visibility issue with, with, those, with the locations. Yes, it does say two feet, but we will make sure that there's no visibility issues with it. Is there any other questions? No, Chair. I have one. Mr. Lopez? I have a question on the construction signs. There, the way you worded it to us, you said there were temporary signs for the building, for the I guess the restaurant or business that was under construction then removed, but realistically they're up there permanently until the entire project is completed, correct? Yes. That's really not clearly stated in that. Okay, so what section of the agreement? Early on Just, the construction okay. sign, the way the wording is stated, it says the construction signs will be removed 10 days after the property has been built. But that means that another property can go in and put the sign on there. So it, these are habitually permanent signs until the entire project is done. Is that not correct? It, it says until the issuance of the certificate of occupancy. Okay. Yes. So however long it takes for them to get the certificate of occupancy is how long it will be. Are we up. talking for the entire project or just for that building? It's for that building. It's, a, it's the premise. It's whatever's on that premise. But according to the construction signs, they are going prim primarily and exclusively, but primarily on uh, Mitchell Avenue Boulevard, kind of indicating that this restaurant or this business is under construction. So when that business is finished, it gets, another business can put their sign on that same property. So what I'm saying is that that signage, for the majority of the time, will be a permanent fixture until the entire project mm -hmm. of Oviedo on this park is complete. Is that not correct? Until the con completion of the building, yes. Well, I guess I'm not facing it correctly. Are there any yet? Uh, I'm done. There's I'm certain done. locations. Okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I'm done. No, Madam Chair, I'm I, done. Uh, Mr. Pollack, I, I believe what he's saying. I, I, I think he's, I think he's looking at these coming soon, now open uh, leasing signs no. that are on Mitchell Hammock. No, no, I'm talking about the construction. They, they had there's one section there for construction signs, and it clearly states that they're removed after 10 days of the construction of that particular business. My statement is. But if another business starts construction, then that sign is up there permanently. They're going to be permanently until the entire project is complete. And that's not clearly stated in that. Okay. Okay. I'm looking at the wording now. Huh? I'm looking at the wording okay. now in the agreement. And do you agree or disagree? No, I agree. Mm. 
Madam Chair. Mr. Pollack. I, I had a question about the uh, um, the sandwich board signs. Um, on those sandwich board signs, there's it looks like there's one per business um, per wall if it's on a corner one I guess they get two of them then there's the city ones I mean is this sidewalk gonna just be littered with sandwich boards I mean uh, how I, I would think that you would want them kind of spaced out a certain distance apart rather you, you know use a distance rather than I mean, I understand that every business would want one, but but I could just see, you know, you, you look down the street and all you see sandwich board signs. And and second, you know, is this a a compliance nightmare, you know, with someone with a measuring stick trying to measure these, you know, to, to make sure that they're in compliance with the proper distance and they're not getting in the way and, and, and are properly secured as, as we write it here? Madam Chair. Mr. Sheridan. I'm going to take it a step further. We sat here... 18 months ago, ad nauseum on signs and sandwich boards and attention getting devices and dancing bananas and so forth and so on. I, I guess I just wanted why we're rewriting the whole code. And if we're going to rewrite the whole code, let's just make it for the city. We're, we're an inclusive city, or are we trying to just make Oviedo on the Park look something of itself? Let me state. To the board, the board already knows. I live in Oviedo on the park. I live on the townhouses, so I'm looking forward to all of this stuff being done. But I don't want it to. It, it's part of the city. It needs to be part of the entire city, not just its own location. So why are we making special rules for this area? Since we have Mr. Cop here, maybe we can get him to address that issue. Sorry, everybody. I concur. Madam Chair. Mr. Wright. Oh, waiting. Um, one of the things I looked at was I, I was looking at a lot of the criteria that we set aside for specifically this ordinance that's before us, and I was comparing it to our existing sign codes, and I saw a lot of consistencies in this case about the things that we are doing. It's in numerous cases repetitive, so, you know, and I understand Mr. Sharon Lopez, I guess maybe what I'd to add to that would be, I would like to know if there are any differences specifically to this that might be a reason why we would you know, again, single out this area of our development within the city versus applying it globally to the entire city. That's kind of what I was kind of drilling down to. Is that, Better um, stated. Because I was looking for, I was looking for differences in this. And, and again, without leading and reading chapter and verse, line by line, I didn't see a lot. So maybe that would be a better direction. If there is any specific differences, that helps. Mr. Cobb, perhaps you can shed some light on that as to, um, I guess, councils. Direction. <clears throat> Anticipation. Oh, I could have used that to draw my ship. I didn't even see that. I wanted the model of the ship. Been a while since I've been on this side. Yeah. <laughs> Brian Cobb, City Manager, City of Oviedo, 400 Alexandria Boulevard, Oviedo, Florida, 32765. I'll try to hit the I'll try to hit the uh, the questions as best I can. Uh, Mr. Cavanaugh and I have been working closely uh, on this. Let's uh, let me back up and let's just a little bit about why we're here tonight and why we're doing a statutory development agreement. Um, Article 6 of the Land Development Code addresses signage. It's Article 6.40, I think is what it is. It addresses signage within, uh, within the downtown mixed-use village core and downtown mixed-use new downtown zoning districts. And that sign code was established to create a look, 
and you don't have to go very far to find it. It's Meisner Park in Boca Raton. And it was written at a time when there was a specific environment that was supposed to be created, and it was Meisner Park. The framers of the Land Development Code at that time wanted to create, recreate, basically, Meisner Park in Oviedo. Um, we're, not ex we're not following that model, quite honestly. And so the Land Development Code that's in Article 6, which is specific to this property, really doesn't fit with the approved planning that's been going on for the last five years? Five years. And so one of the things that it does do, though, it allows us to have what we call, it calls, an area-wide signage plan that the property owner can propose. And we had some little dilemmas when we were looking at this. And one of the things that we were also trying to look at lessons learned from the first phase of Oviedo on the Park. But one of the things, this will be easier. Make sure you can hear me. Mr. Cadaval had some specific needs. One of the things was was that when he's been talking with the different commercial businesses, a lot of them are telling them that along here, along Center Lake Lane, along City Plaza, along the back side of City Walk Lane, they need exposure on Mitchell Hammock Road. Well, if you're looking within our land development code, the only way that you can have signage on Mitchell Hammock Road is to actually have frontage on Mitchell Hammock Road because our land development code is very clear in Article 14 as well as in Article 6 that you cannot have off-site signage. It's the same as having a billboard. And so that was a dilemma that we had to come about. We had to address it. One of the, one of the things we thought about, well, we could just configure the lot structure so that those lots not only had frontage on Center Lake Lane or on City Walk, but also had frontage on Mitchell Hammock Road. The thing about it was, was that what, what would we do if Mike Roberto Way? We could look at uh, Mr. Cavanaugh not dedicating it to the city. However, that doesn't fit within the long-range vision of Oviedo on the Park and being able to create that, create that throughway from Oviedo, on the, from Oviedo Boulevard over to 434. So we had to look at ways that we could address those types of issues, such as making sure that these businesses have some type of exposure on Mitchell Hammock Road. Also, Mr. Cavanaugh has struggled in this area with temporary signage. Uh, we probably spent the most of our meetings, we meet, we meet every week, we probably spent most of our meetings talking about temporary signage and how we could accommodate temporary signage. Not only do you have an issue for the different businesses that are going to want temporary signage, but also with the, with the residential areas needing leasing signage. But then there's also Center Lake Park needing signage for events and different things that are going on in Center Lake Park. So we had to come up with an, a way to prepare a master sign plan. Now one of the things that the city attorney, we had to bring the city attorney in on this as well. And the city attorney said that, well, to be able to give create this public right-of-way, which is going to divide this whole part of the property from Mitchell Hammock Road, we have to do a statutory development agreement. And within the statutory development agreement, we have to create a public purpose. There has to be a public benefit to allowing these things that aren't normally allowed within your land development code. Which gets me to my your first question. Why are we doing this for here and not doing it globally? We've always treated Oviedo on the park separately from the rest of the city. Um, it had its own sign code to begin with. And so we're operating within the constraints of that sign code by bringing forward a master plan that creates a uniform look within Oviedo on the park. If you notice, most of the signage actually reflects what we're already building out there. We're just memorializing it. Rather than having staff have to come in continually, go to city council to say, we need a deviation for this. Uh, David Weekly Homes to the north, we had to get a deviation. The townhome complex, we had to get a deviation. Lot 12's coming in, we're gonna have to get a deviation for that as well. So we wanted to memorialize it and say, to uh, address those types of things. But we also wanted to be able to create 
through the signage to add to the look of a beat on the park. Uh, Mr. Young, you asked about uh, the different banner locations. Yes, when they come in for those permits, we are going to have to look at the exact location. That permit's going to have to spell it out. They're going to have to look at the site triangles because you're right, those turning rooms are very tight. And so then, and when you think about something that's 45 square feet and 15 feet tall, they're going to have to, uh, they're going to, have to address those things. And one of the things that we wanted to do, if you look on the key map in the locations, we, wanted, we had to address all of the locations that it was possible. But then we put the limitations on the individual properties so that they're specific to that, that business. Also, they're specific to whether or not the strand. And I'll, I'll, throughout, the, throughout the agreement, you see the strand and the strand too. Let me tell you where they are. This is the strand. This is the strand too. Okay? And, of course, the leasing trade is going here somewhere. Mr. Cavanaugh's idea is that this right here is going to be our commercial street. Uh, we, we like to call it Restaurant Row, that's what we like to call it. But, and Mr. Lopez, you, you, you all are spot on. The construction signs are going to be there as long as there's a need for a construction interest. And so, when the strand, I believe, Tommy's still looking at strand first? Possibly still looking at strand first? When Mr. Cavanaugh starts the strand, he can either start the strand or the strand two. Those are the two that are the furthest along uh, in the development process. Yes, we're looking at this area here and this area here being our construction entrances. Why did we choose those? Because we didn't want the construction vehicles going up City Walk Lane. And we didn't want them, City, uh, City, I'm sorry, City Plaza. And we didn't want them coming in Center Lake either. And so that's why we chose these two areas on Macroberto and City Walk so that we could get the construction vehicles away from the existing parts of, uh, of Oviedo on the park. So yes, as long as we're under construction, most likely those signs are going to be there. You're spot on with that. Um, regarding the sandwich boards, Mr. Sheridan, we had that same concern, and that's one of the reasons why we put the limitation in that they would only get one. That's why we put the limitation in that they can only be there when the business is open. Now, the one thing that we have to guard against, and that's going to fall a lot on my shoulders and working with Mr. Bolware, is that when we have events at Center Lake Park, he's making sure that he's very prudent about his use of sandwich boards as well. Uh, we obviously want Center Lake Park to be uh, the event mecca in Oviedo, and so there's a lot of things that go on. But part of this public benefit is the allowance of Mr. Bowyer and the recreation staff to utilize the different types of signage to promote the events at Center Lake Park. If you'll notice uh, in your plan, there is um, here, where City, City Walk Lane comes into Mitchell Hammock, there are two signs on, there's one sign on each side of the road for Center Lake Park. And it's a, um, the way it's drawn, it's a, it's, a, uh, it's a static sign that can be removed and put back in. So that it says Center Lake Park when there's not an event, but when there's an event, a new sign can be placed in. Uh, the City Council is also exploring ideas about the possibility of it being an electronic sign one day. We have to deal with color. <laughs> but we're warming up to that. You know. uh, can I say? Yes, sir. Can I, can I, can I interject? You know, Mr. Cobb, I don't think, I can only speak for myself, but having the conversations we've had on this board before, I don't think any of us are opposed to right. your request for signage for, for Oviedo on the Park. I think it's a great idea. Here's where our concern lies, is we're giving an unfair advantage to them and to our other business partners in Oviedo not being able to use the same signage. And that to me, as a citizen for 20 some years here in the city, that's a disadvantage to those, comp those businesses. You've got, you know, LA Fitness over to the one side, you've got TJ's uh, seafood, he's not going to be able to put those sandwich signs as the rest of them. How are, the, how are we supposed to support the people that have been supporting us? For, some 20 plus years in this city. That's what my concern is currently. You know, I think the signages are fine. I think we have too many restrictions on the signage. So I'm all for it. But what do we do for our other businesses in Oviedo? I can tell you that um, you're right. This, this is a special place. And yes, we do give the businesses that are going to go in there special things. We allow bars in here. We don't allow bars anywhere else in the city of Oviedo. Uh, there's lots of things that we do in here 
And it was part of that overall vision that when we created Oviedo on the Park, that we were going to make it that special place. We were going to send those things there, and we were going to do the extra things that we're not doing elsewhere. Um, there is some things that are going to actually, ad nauseum was a great term. Uh, there's going to be more coming on the sign code. <laughs> City attorney's working on it right now. And so you may see some of the elements that we are using in here coming into the overall um, because of some things that have ha happened lately in the court system. So there are changes coming. It's just that these got out ahead. We were able to implement them through this statutory development agreement. Yes, it is a partnership between, it's, it's another extension of that public-private partnership that we've been carrying out so, you know, since uh, we started the project. And so that's part of it. There are city signs in here. There are private signs in here. As Ms. Pierre mentioned, uh, one of the new things that we're doing is the post signs that are in public right of way. And there's going to be private businesses listed on there. Now, the, the post signs aren't to direct you anywhere. They're to tell you what's in that area. And so they're strategically placed uh, throughout the, the area. And so and there was a number of things that we had to to address and like I said we tried to do it as comprehensively as we could yes this is a special place yes if there's a business in here they're going to have more more favors than what our other businesses would have but that doesn't prevent us from taking the concepts that we do here and apply them elsewhere we could do that um, this was the first place we ever experimented with architectural standards and lessons learned from those architectural standards actually went into preparing the overall architectural standards throughout the city. So yeah, easily this is our guinea pig, and then we take it and lessons learned and we use it elsewhere. So you're correct, it is, this is a special place. We do special things here, and it's, the code has always been that way. That's how come the Land Development Code says, if it's in here and it's in the rest of the code, this overrules it. You know, this one is the one that takes precedent. So. Let's see, I'm trying to see if I've gotten uh, Mr. Wright. There's a lot of, just the fact that this allows signage that, you know, when we talk about properties that are on Center Lake and over in this part of City Walk having signage on Mitchell Hammock Road, that is the huge, biggest difference of all. And that's why this has to be a statutory development agreement, not a normal development agreement that we usually do. That's why it has to be a statutory development agreement, why it has to be adopted by ordinance. And that's why it has to have a public benefit. Otherwise, we probably would have looked at the signage for the city, but uh, there's got to be a public benefit involved. And so allowing park signage along Mitchell Hammock Road, allowing park signage um, out as far as 434, you know, so that people on 434 can see there's something going on in the park. Um, those are things that we had to incorporate into this agreement so that it would meet the intent of what the statutes call for. So. Can I Certainly. I have a follow-up. She's my cohort in crime, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so, Teresa Curia, Development Services Director. Um, the temporary signs, you are absolutely correct, because the way the, it, the, the plan is set up is they will be permanent for a while. That is absolutely correct. Not only for the only construction signs, the other signs as well. But because of that, they need to have that look. What we try to get in Ovidon the Park, and that is the whole idea of the plan, is to have this uniform you know, design plan. So it's not any temporary signs. We didn't want exactly to avoid that each business would bring, uh, you know, its own temporary sign, its own attention getting device. So the idea of this plan is actually to guide the look that we want, the character that we want for the, 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 the new downtown. So there is, it's true, but there is also the restriction that it has to look like that. And my and concern the, really wasn't that they were being there, I think it was the way that it was worded in the, in, the, in, the, in, in there, that it was very misleading or misguiding to anyone that would just look at it. That's my concern. Okay. I, we'll I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm all, I'm sure all in the with the signs. I think it, we need the signs. Businesses need to be advertising their signs. 
you know, I have been to Meisner Park in Boca Raton many times, so I understand the area, what it looks like, and it's done very classy. So I get it. We cannot restrict businesses, but at the same token, we've, we've got to be... Talking about that, so the Ovidon Park has actually some restrictions nowadays that it's, that's more restrictive than other places in the city. So attention-getting devices, for instance, are not allowed. In Ovidon Park, they are allowed in, in other places, right? And you can have different types of attention-getting devices. With this plan, we are allowing attention-getting devices, but again, has to be that kind of, you know, uh, uh, attention to the device that is a structured vertical banner. We joke that the the man, that is wa the waving man, will not be able to come to a video on the park. So there are some restrictions. We are we allow them in other areas. The sandwich boards. I mean, it's it's an, also different an, an interesting discussion because if we have a, a series of sandwich boards boards next to the business, yeah, I think it's going to be a good problem if you have that, because what we want here is a lively place, you know, and they, they need to be next to the, the door, you know, to the, the construction. So if you go to Park Place or Park, um, Park Avenue in Winter Park on a Saturday, you'll see that, you know, a line of, of sandwich boards. We want to have that problem here too. I mean, it, our code enforcement people will be checking, you know, if they don't, uh, obstruct the sidewalk, but that's the kind of problem we would love to have in Oviedo, you know, to have, you know, that kind of, the, a lot of businesses to the city. So that was, you know, the, the whole idea of the, the plan was to have, to bring, you know, to allow signage, but to bring uh, uh, the character, you know, that we wanted. So that's why it's, it's very much based on the design. And uh, so it's gonna be more expensive signs too. And, uh, and maybe other, you know, areas or other shopping plazas will also come and propose to have something like that through a, a development agreement. So that, that's also a possibility for anyone in the city. So, okay. Thank you, Teresa. Mr. Wright, you had another question, follow-up? Well, it was a question is related to what we're talking about here, but a different topic is, uh, <clears throat> you know, recently we did something similar where we allowed off-site signage for the mall. And we allowed them to put in some large signs that advertises their business. You know, again, I was a proponent of it. I just wanted to know if there was any adverse reactions to it. I mean, because this is kind of what we're doing. Not necessarily as large a scale, you know, and there's some, as, you know, we just heard, there's some aesthetics and there's some guidelines to how the look and the thing was it like that. But, I mean, again, I'm... I, I think it's a good idea. I'm just wondering if there was any, you know, what we approved, how did that, how did that go over? I mean, it's a, not necessarily subject to this, but. Other than it being very you know, ugly. You don't yeah. need it's Facebook. I know. It's yeah. atrocious. Yeah. Yeah. Excuse I, but, or, what I've heard is it's nice, wrong color. Oh, color is. The quote I had, the comment that I received on it was, you forgot the comma. <laughs> <laughs> we fixed it. <laughs> Can uh, we paint it? A, we need another color. I mean, it's I, the, the mall picked the color. It's horrible, and uh, it reflects the mall. So, <laughs> but no, we haven't. Um, from what I understand, the mall is uh, very happy with it. I've I've seen a few of the comments as well. It's certainly attention getting. It Absolutely. catches the eye. It sure does. It's, and, it's fast. But once again, that was another uh, working within the constraints of the development of regional impact, working within the constraints of the plan unit development, uh, working with the adjacent property owners. Uh, there's another one planned over on 426, but there's some legal issues that have to be addressed first before that one can go up. There's a third one planned outside of um, Macy's that uh, is structured for being visible from 417 and it's quite large larger than those uh, one of the things that we looked at in dealing with that was yep. what the county would allow and those signage actually are shorter and shorter right if i remember right i think the county would allow they would allow up to 15 feet right and uh, those are 
12. Yeah, they're 12 feet. So they're actually shorter than what the county would allow. There was supposed to be one at the corner of uh, Mall Boulevard and Red Bug, uh, but the ABC liquor store would not buy in. So you could add two of them. Wouldn't be able to see it. Yeah, exactly. So can we apply lessons learned that any more that are approved, we also get to approve the color? <laughs> <laughs> that is a possibility, yes. So that it blends in? Right. And that's At least the, things, you know, the surrounding part of it. You know, speaking with this, all the signage within this does have to be in the form of veto on the park. Signage here is very nice. It's, it really is. I mean, I, I can't argue mm -hmm. with the signage over here. No, they, but veto, your question, like I said, your questions were correct. Yeah. So. <clears throat> and Mr. Cobb, it appears there's going to be a lot fewer signs since there's a lot less commercial in the new downtown than what we first anticipated when the park was approved all those years ago. Actually, there, there appears to be a lot more housing in it than the requirement. Actually, the what requirement we, was 85,000 square feet of commercial. That's the requirement. Um, this plan here is going to exceed that. And the from the 2007 plan, actually I should let him do this. He does this story better than I do. But when you look at the 2007 plan that was proposed by Broad Street Partners, the commercial was limited to this area here. This area in here was all residential. Uh, there was a library proposed right here. There was some mixed use in this area. And there was, this was mixed use as well. Well, this building's mixed use. It's got retail on the bottom and it's got about 15,000 square feet, right? And it's got residential. The only difference is, is that Broad Street had envisioned the retail wrapping around. Mr. Cavanaugh's studies have shown that the, having the retail on the bottom across from the park is not gonna work. So you've got residential, which we think is good because now we got eyes on the park. But the, so the commercial is going to be along in here. This whole street here is going to be commercial. If he's successful, one of the things he's also looking at is to go multi-story in this area as well. And of course, we've got the large, the large building here that has multiple ways that this building can be used as here. But this area all in here was, has always been anticipated being residential. This building was anticipated originally to be a mixed use. Obviously, it's in apartments. This area here was always apartments in condo type, and then the, the townhomes over there. So he's not very far off from what was originally planned. I think if we looked at the original plan, probably the biggest difference was there was some space in here that they called flex space, and they weren't really sure what they were gonna do with it. But as far as what he could achieve in here, he's, he's actually on spot with what Broad Street was proposing back in 2007. So he's very close, but I think probably the biggest difference is, is that what was looked at by Broad Street in here was less intensive than what Mr. Cavanaugh, Mr. Cavanaugh's bringing a more urban look on this corner than what Broad Street had originally proposed. So. <coughs> Madam Chair. Mr. Wright. Uh, you mentioned earlier that, as you referred to the strand on the north, well, plan right there, and then strand two is in the center? That's strand two? Yes. The strand one was saying that would be the next phase to be being looked at? Yes. Okay. Um, actually, they're both going through process right now. They're both being processed. Okay. And actually, I think if Mr. Kavanaugh is able to work it out on the financial side, they'll go simultaneously. I just, uh, my question, is, and again, it's, it, unfortunately, it's not relative to this, <laughs> what we're looking at right now, but the, it came up, is that, um, at one point, there was a the, the agreement, the development agreement was modified for the requirement to have X amount of space of commercial space built prior to completion of the townhomes, completion of the apartments. There was, and we changed that. We modified that because of the in, uh, economic environment. It was right. modified so that we could push the commercial development further out when there was a better, bigger market draw, stuff like that. Um, what is this? I mean, if, if the Residential part is kind of like what you're saying is the next step simultaneous to the other one. 
what's the status of that? I mean, are we still postponing commercial at this point and moving forward with more residential at this time to allow that to happen? He's not saying. He's got, he's got a grin on his face. Actually, I, I, I mean, I, answers no. No? Quite honestly. Uh, along Oviedo Boulevard, Mr. Cavanaugh has 10,000? 14,000 square feet of office space embedded on the first floor within this apartment complex. You also have an office here in this area. Yes. And the Strand 2 has 15,000 of retail going in at the same time. Yes, you're right. The development agreement was altered because you had phase one that required uh, 40,000 square feet of retail along with the uh, first 250 dwelling units. And then phase two brought in the 45,000 with the rest of the dwelling units. And we pushed that phase one and put all the 85,000 into one, one thing, one phase. So what Mr. Cavanaugh is doing, one of the things what the city council requires is that he has to put in the infrastructure when he puts it in. When he puts the first phase in, the infrastructure goes in as well. But the way that the buildings are structured, this is the only area that we're really uncertain about right now. And so if we had to say that commercial is being pushed off, it's just because that's taking longer to negotiate. But all of that infrastructure is going in with these mixed-use buildings. So it'll be there for people when, as, as Mr. Kavanaugh says, when he's sitting there talking with them, he can say this is going to get built. One of the things with this sign plan was that they ask about that. They ask about when, <laughs> what can I do for signage? And so now he can say, you know, this is, this is the plan. You're going to have exposure on Mitchell Hammock Road. You're going to be able to put out a sandwich board in front of you to announce your specials. Uh, if we have a, one of the things Mr. Cavanaugh talks about a lot, we talk about a lot about shutting down this road and creating street festivals out of it, much like the Recreation Department does on Center Lake, so that allowing people to have signage on those types of special events. But the, about the only, here on the corner, and then up City Walk, or that's probably the area that you might say gets pushed out. But both of these buildings are mixed use buildings. No, so that's, that's a perfect answer. I mean, I, that's kind of what I was looking at. It's not all residential. And number right. two, phasing of it is, makes much more sense because I wouldn't want to push those restaurants in there because those are the primary construction entrances to get to the other side. So you want to get the outskirts done first and then come back in and finish the building. So it makes and sense. One of the things that he's learned as well is. And like I said, the success of this roadway is going to dictate whether or not we're going to be multi-story is that the restaurants say they, want, they don't want people above them. And for good reason. Restaurants are loud. They stay open late. <laughs> people don't want to live above them. So the, uh, there's also the opportunity, and something that Mr. Cavanaugh has built into these, is that there's an opportunity there for live work as well. So they could, they could do that as well. But there is, there is office space there. So answer is yes and no, I guess. Let me change my answer. It's yes and no. Uh, yes in that we're not sure what the timing is going to be on this, but I think when the infrastructure goes in, I think it's going to give him more, more ammunition to go out and to recruit heavier, even though he does have a number of things in the iron right now. It's just that he can't say what they are. <laughs> No, I'm satisfied with the answer. Yeah. I mean, it's not. It, it, the fact that, you know, whether it's office, commercial, retail, it doesn't matter. It, we are incorporating that, you know. Yes. We're just not, it's not on a continual postponement. And that's, you gave me the answer I was looking for. Thank you. Yeah, but the biggest part people are waiting for is that street. And, and I mean, all we, all we as, as citizens see are more and more residential popping up. Um, we don't, you know, and then we see a couple out parcels, um, you know, you know, put in at the front, but everybody is waiting for that street. Everybody wants that street and, and all anybody sees is more residential right. and, and it, and it's, and it's very frustrating, very frustrating. Um, you and, and, you know. <laughs> he and I talk about this every week. Right. And, and, I'm sure. You have to create the mass. Right. And you create the mass through the homes. We've done a lot. I mean, as far as the apartments and the townhomes, the neighborhood above, the townhome neighborhood coming in on lot 12, and there's a, another very intensive thing to the north of David Weekly that we're working with right now. 
that we're creating the mass. The thing is, is that I, I, one of the things we talk about is the retailers and the restaurant folks. They're sort of like deer right now. If they see and you smell you, they get spooked. Okay, and so we have to be sort of stealth about it, but we've got to create the mass. We've got to create that willingness for them to come. One of the things they look at is they want people in close proximity. And I know you and I have had many arguments uh, through the year about, you know, he says, I've got to have more units. And I'm like, I've already got 16,000. But those are people that have to drive there. He loves Mr. Sheridan. Mr. Sheridan can walk there every day and eat at his restaurants. That's what he loves. And will. You know, so I mean, that's the thing. And, you know, Kingsbridge is going to help because they can walk there. Uh, and the more people that we put in close proximity to walk there, one of the biggest issues I'm dealing with right now is lighting along Claire Lee Evans Way because the folks that live in Park Place and live over in the Hamptons walk to the Publix and we need better lighting to get them to and from the Publix. So, you know, that's one of the things that this is already having an impact on how we think of things. You know, when Alfay Woods was developed and they put in the carriage style street lamps, how quaint and, hey, let's go stroll, but they don't provide a lot of light. You know, so those are some of the things that we're, we're going to have to work on <coughs> as sure. well. Something else is you guys have to look at public transportation. Yes, and that's part of the plan. Yeah. That's part of it as well. I was disappointed that um, we've been sort of left out of the discussion on, on the train. Um, but uh, as I mentioned to our county commission, that our residents will be the best in shape residents because that three blocks we have to walk from the closest bus stop to the Longwood station. <laughs> so uh, I, we, will, we will be the most physically fit of those folks riding the train. So. But it's coming. Yes, Mr. Pollock, we've got to put the residential in to, draw, to be that draw. And it's not about how many residential units we have here in the city. It's how many residential units of people that are going to be willing to walk to that commercial on a daily basis is what we have to look at. Madam Chair. Mr. Wright. <clears throat> this sign particularly, the one that's got the changeable copy on it, the electronic mm -hmm. sign, I didn't see that anywhere. Where, is that... Is that the one you talked about you're being discussed, or is that got a fixed location? No, it's in, right? it's in, it's it's a fixed in location. Where is, where is that located? Okay. Um, it's okay. There's going to be one sign here east of City Walk, or west of City Walk, and one sign east of City Walk. Okay. So I, I saw it. It's, it. it's not one sign. There's two, it's basically There's two, two, of them. two of them look like yes, that. Yes, okay. and All they'll right. be built into the entrance feature coming into City Walk Lane there. You know, okay. So it'll have the entrance feature. Um, Probably the best, best graphic, and this was one of the things I had Mr. Cavanaugh do so that City Council could see, you know, how it all fits together. But if you look on, mm -hmm. oh, I mean, I, yeah. on page six, I believe it is, yeah, page six of the plan, I'm not opposed to the sign. you can see how you have the two city signs on each side. Mm -hmm. And they, actually, the, the, the designers actually showed you how they fit to scale with the buildings that are planned. So you have the two city signs. And then you have the arch there as well. And so it all fits into the entrance feature coming in from, off of Mitchell Hammock Road onto, onto City Walk. Okay, you're right, that's a better graph. And it shows you the construction signs and then how the coming soon, now open leasing signs also fit into the equation. And if you want to see the whole corridor, you have to look here, but it's very small, so it's hard. that's why we asked to do the, the blow up. Are there any other questions? <clears throat> Good. Thank you, Mr. Cobb. Oh, thank you. It feels good to be back. <laughs> have to it's do been a long often. time. Okay, this is a public hearing item. So we'll open it up for public hearing at this time. If there's anyone wishing to speak on this item. Seeing them will, I'm sorry? There was a gentleman sitting here all night and he just went to the bathroom. Okay, I tell you what, why don't we take about a five minute recess? Just to make sure he does and then we'll, just, to sit, just in case. Then we'll come back. I just looked and I saw an empty helmet. Yes. 
Go. Okay, we'll call the meeting back to order.
Um, we just opened it up for public hearing. So is there anyone here wishing to speak on this item? Seeing none, we'll close public hearing. What's the board's pleasure? Madam Chair. Mr. Sheridan? I'd like to make a motion to recommend approval of ordinance number 1637 as written. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Mr. Young? Is there any further discussion? I'm good. Seeing none, we'll call the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. This item will be come up for first reading before the City Council May 2nd, 2016 at 630 in these chambers, and then for public hearing and consideration for adoption on May 16th, 2016 at 630 in these chambers. The next item on the agenda are discussion items. We don't have anything listed on um, our agenda. Does any of the board members have anything we need to discuss? Okay, our future meeting dates are May 10th, May 24th, and June 14th. Deborah, do we know at this time if any of those meetings are likely to be canceled or? Uh, we are scheduling something for May 10th. It's a deviation, so we will have something that night. Okay. It's your shed. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> if there's nothing further, do we have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. All those in favor say thank you. All those in favor say aye. 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 We stand adjourned. We got it. One of these days, we just got to stay silent. <laughs> <laughs> I was actually waiting for you guys to not make a motion. <laughs> oh, we were thinking about it. We were thinking about it.